Good Friday morning. Uh, it's great to be back here with you this Friday. Um, my name is Tim. I will be your host for today's Backyard Naturalist episode. And for better and for worse, uh, I'm really into this personal journey of learning more about uh, the natural history of what we consider, what we put into the box of, of pests, of household pests, of backyard pests, of, of pain in the asses, annoyances, problems. Um, these lovely animals that in, invoke fear or 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 make you shudder or disdain, um, depending on your personal relationship with them, um, you know, you've either suffered through or been fascinated by them, or hopefully both. Uh, things like ticks and noceums, earwigs, mosquitoes, yellow jackets, rats, uh, other animals that have adapted to lead very successful lifestyles in the presence of and because of the presence of humans, uh, our homes, our backyards, urban areas. Uh, and for most of these animals, you can usually learn a, a lot. If you if you search and Google them, everything you learn is is from all these pest control sites. Uh, it's, you know, like how to eradicate them. And then sometimes there's a little bit of natural history, but it's really just the things you want to know. So here on Backyard Naturalist, we just, we take a, take you deeper into this world um, of the pests and, and look at them in the context of, of their behavior and their ecology and their physiology. So even if you still hate them, uh, maybe you respect them a little bit more. Maybe you understand them a little bit better. I think that can only be a good thing uh, usually. And so for today's installment of this creepy, collie, annoying naturalist uh, look at the, the maligned bed bug, uh, oh, bed bug in boats invokes terror and disgust and the creeps, even if we don't understand them. Um, but now we hope to better understand them in episode six of season five of the Backyard Naturalist with a new tagline provided by Larry, exploring the extraordinary natural systems in your backyard and beyond. Uh, and beyond this is a bed bug's life. So uh, first of all, as always, thank you for watching. We really appreciate you. We're glad you're here. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who have uh, renewed your subscription to the Backyard Naturalist. We are working on bigger, better, and more nerdy things to come for season five. If you'd like to join this fun group, please visit our website and learn more about how you can support this program through a subscription uh, and the benefits uh, to becoming of becoming a subscriber. It's almost official official enough to, to pencil it into your calendars. Our next subscriber appreciation field trip is going to be led by veteran Bill Keen. So he he led the trip through the three billion year walk at the at Riverside Park Urban Ecology Center. He led the trip downtown that looked at the geology of the buildings, which was super fascinating. Um, my favorite local geologist. Uh, and he is, oh, he also was a backyard, he had a backyard naturalist episode on soils. Um, so Dr. Keene has offered to take us on a geology walk through Doctors Park, uh, which I think is going to be really fascinating, and that will likely be on October 28th. We're still confirming the details, but uh, these trips, again, are open to anyone and free for subscribers, and I will keep you posted. Also, um, the Urban Ecology Center's Eco Travel Program has three uh, locations for the coming year. So one is Southern California at the end of winter. And as I mentioned before, we should have more details on this soon. We're also heading back to a world like no other, the Galapagos. Uh, this trip is open and ready for registration. There is still space available. And uh, we're heading back to Costa Rica this year in our first accessible international trip. So uh, please contact me for details on any of these trips. And um, there are some more updates in the world of space exploration since our backyards are linked with a direct view to the skies. Uh, a few weeks ago, I mentioned that the Indian Space Research Organization is getting closer to launching their first human mission into space to join with other countries and private organizations in this new space race back to the moon, back to Mars. Um, the next step, which will be happening soon, is to make sure that the system that's put in place to rescue the crew in case of an emergency works properly, which seems like a very smart thing to test, in my opinion. Um, 
I also mentioned a few weeks ago that an asteroid sample collected by NASA was going to be touching down on Earth, and it did. Uh, seven years after the launch, uh, launch into space, um, after four billion miles of traveling, Osiris Rex flew by Earth. Uh, didn't fly to Earth; it flew by Earth and was able to deliver a payload, uh, a sample from the near-Earth asteroid Bennu. Um, it landed in a Defense Department test range in Utah. The spacecraft itself is not done. It just delivered that pay payload, and now it's off to look at a different asteroid in this epic road trip. So it's going to go to an asteroid named Apophis. Same spacecraft. Now it has a new mission and a new name. So OSIRIS-REx was successful, and now it becomes OSIRIS-APEX, which stands for Apophis Explorer. And so now we have almost a pound of asteroid here on Earth, um, and, and there's a lot of work still to happen so that it's undergoing a thorough sanitation um if you've seen the movie aliens hopefully they're gonna make sure that doesn't happen here on earth uh it's going to be moved to a clean room inside the johnson space center in houston and then this bit of, of sample is going to be uh divided and then sent to labs around the globe which is really cool so uh it's going to go to mission partners in Canada and Japan. And 70% uh, of the sample is just gonna remain in storage for future generations that will likely have better technology with which to study it. So that's really cool. Um, and then the, the other mission that we're watching closely is, a, is also an asteroid mission, the Psyche mission. Um, that will be the first to visit a metallic asteroid uh, ever. We haven't ever, humans have never visited an, a metallic asteroid. Uh, and that could give us really important clues about our own planet, which has a metallic core. Um, and the launch date was supposed to have happened already, but it was pushed back to next week, Thursday, October 12th. Um, so you can kind of stay posted on that mission. You can watch the launch uh, streaming live uh, by visiting NASA's website. And then finally, we can all look forward to the next big meteor shower here. Uh, on Earth, from our backyards, the Orionids, which are already active and will be all the way until November 22nd, but they will peak the night of October 20th, which is a Friday night, so you can stay up as late as you need to, uh, and you will probably have to because the moon sets around midnight, so ideal optimal viewing will be from about midnight until 4 a.m. Um, the Orionids originate from the incoming trail of Halley's Comet. Uh, it's a medium strength shower. You can expect 10 to 20 streaks per hour. It has in the past, however, produced up to 70 per hour in peak years. So now this, this moment you've all been waiting for, uh, here it is for your viewing, for your listening, for your learning pleasure, the beautiful bed bug. So beautiful, so cute, just like a little button. Um, ready to be the center of some bed bug stories for you today. I I usually like to start with my, my personal stories that, you know, my relationships with the featured organisms. I have to admit, I feel very lucky and relieved uh, that I have yet to, at least to my knowledge, meet this wonderful creature firsthand. Um, and as much as I respect it, and it's amazing adaptations. I would prefer not to meet this one up close if possible. I'm perfectly fine with just the book learning, the pictures. Um, so we'll jump right into the bed bug's place on the tree of life. They're from the order Hemiptera, of course, an insect. Um, Hemiptera means half wing. And it, it's in reference that X pattern you often see on the back uh, is because part of the wings are translucent. Um, so bed bugs are cousins to a few other previous backyard naturalist stars, the 17-year cicada, the spittle bug, the brown marmorated stick bug. Um, but from here, the bed bugs break bed bugs break off into the family Semicidae. And just like the earwig is not a species but a genus, the bed bug is not a single species, but it's actually a whole family. There's a whole family of bed bugs, about a hundred species or so, not huge. Uh, another term for bed bugs is simicids. So if you want to sound all sciencey and geeky and impress your friends, um, 
maybe you have a friend with a bed bug problem and maybe it's a little more gentler to say, how is your simicid problem doing than, than saying, how's your bed bug problem doing? Um, and, and you just sound cool. There, there is no shame in having bed bugs. Uh, and there it's, it's a, it's a fact of life. It's not a sign of dirtiness or uncleanliness. Like I think has always been thought of. It just is. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, the, the entire group, all 100 species, feed exclusively and entirely on blood. Um, Warm-blooded animals, mammals and birds, uh, would be the perfect Halloween character, in my opinion. Um, you're looking for a good Halloween costume. You know, it, I'm not sure why it hasn't already joined the vampire bat, the, the black cat um, in Halloween lore, but they feed exclusively on blood of, uh, like I said, warm-blooded mammals and birds, nothing else. Uh, and three of those 100 species have evolved to feed almost entirely on human beings. Yay. Um, oops, go back here. Um, this is usually the point where I kind of like get into the weeds about like physiology, anatomy, behavior. Um, bed bugs probably love to hide in the weeds. But today I'm just going to jump right into the point uh, and talk about why bed bugs just kind of suck, literally and figuratively, and are a big problem. They're, they have a wonderfully successful strategy of feeding. Um, they come out at night, usually, almost all of them come out at night. They find their host, they take a blood meal, and then they run away and hide. And that's pretty much it. That is a very successful pattern of behavior. Come out at night get your meal, sneak it, go and hide. Um, for the mammal host, usually mammals, sometimes birds, they just have no idea. They were sleeping when this all happened. Um, the only potential flaw in the strategy is that they're very, very small. Mammals tend to be a lot bigger. Mammals groom themselves. Um, so uh, they have to make sure that their strategy is finding a reliable source of mammals or animals and then a place to hide. Um, so not not they're not gonna their their strategy isn't gonna go out and just like I'm gonna go look for a mammal. They need to get this kind of all set up in advance. They need to be good planners. So enter the perfect bed bug habitat um, that has all the things a bed bug needs: a steady supply of warm blooded mammals, if not the same one, over and over again. Um, they're sleeping. There's plenty of places to hide. And all the bed bug needs to do is hide and then come out at night and feed. So it's luxury living for you. It's also luxury living for the bed bugs, all rolled into one container. Uh, it doesn't have to be a hotel room. It can just be as easily be your room, same conditions. Um, but then you might ask, okay, well, bed bugs have been around a lot longer than humans. So what did they do before the invention of the hotel? Um, and that's a great question. While they were waiting for the hotel Motel Six to to become prolific, um, they were very successful with the kind of the animal version of the bedroom or the hotel room, which is the nest or a roost. So, also bed bug paradise, a steady supply of warm blooded hosts uh, for food that are also coming back to the same place every night or every morning to sleep. So regular supply of blood, plenty of hiding places, plenty of opportunities for bed bugs while they're waiting for us to evolve. Um, and with birds and bats and sometimes humans, you don't necessarily need a physical nest or a roost um, because nests for birds in particular aren't necessarily for sleeping. They're for raising young. Um, most of the year birds don't sleep in nests, but there are communal uh, nesting, communal, communal sleeping areas uh, nighttime. So the bed bugs don't necessarily need to find a nest. They could just find one of these places where warm blooded animals tend to congregate with a regular supply of blood. Of course, nests are convenient. So this is a bed bug infestation of a swallow nest, if you think you're having a bad bed bug situation. Um, but the other really important factor here is that after a bed bug feeds, it runs away and hides. And it needs some time to digest the blood. Usually takes several days, um, can be shorter, can be longer. 
So a typical bed bug is feeding about once or twice a week. They don't need us there every night. Um, so even if it's not a very popular hotel chain, it's going to do fine. In fact, uh, one of the reasons that bed bugs are so hard to eradicate is they can hide out and wait uh, for over a year, uh, even up to a year and a half in between feedings. Um, so even if it's your cabin that you visit only once a year, uh, that's enough from the bed bugs perspective. Um, they just need one host pretty much in a calendar year. That's not the optimal situation for them, but it's a survival situation for them. Um, you know, birds only nest, only using their nest during the nesting season, they're gone for nine months. Uh, the bed bugs can be like, yeah, okay, we'll wait. We'll see in April and they'll be just fine without their host. Um, so one of the many reasons why bed bugs can be so difficult to eradicate, they're really good at playing the waiting game, uh, the patience game, which is also, by the way, a strategy that other blood sucking organisms like ticks and leeches can use too. The, the waiting game is important. Um, so getting a little more into the weeds, first of all, they're very small. Um, they're very small, which makes them great at hiding. Uh, the bed bugs we're concerned about are about a quarter of an inch long. So, I mean, the pictures we see are going to make them look big, but they're tiny. Um, makes them great for hiding. They also have these flattened oval shapes, which allows them to get into crevices. Um, they, their wings are tiny. They're not, you know, they don't have wings for flying. They're just these remnant wings at the front. So they, they can stick themselves in tiny places at a quarter of an inch long. You can imagine they have a million hiding places. Um, and and they again, they can stay hidden for a long time. And it's not like us where they get hungry and they're like, oh, I'm going to go eat. Um, they wait for cues to come out and eat. So they're stimulated to come out of hiding by either a very small increase in temperature so you can imagine one is is in the folds of or of a mattress, right? And it's in a hotel room and it's not being used for a week. Um, the the bed bug is just sitting there waiting, and then as soon as uh, as soon as a guest comes, that guest brings warmth, body heat under the covers, and the that's a cue for the bed bugs. Oh, there's 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 food nearby. Um, it's not just heat. They also use cues, uh, chemical cues. Some are very specific to certain groups of organisms. Um, and it's interestingly, the, the cues from the organism, let's say it's a bat, that causes it to come out and attr be attracted to the bat. Um, after it's fed, those same chemicals switch from being an attractant to a deterrent because after it's fed, that bed bug is vulnerable Bats like to groom themselves. And so its own physiology actually keeps itself away from the food while it's digesting. So that's a really, really uh, good adaptation. Um, and it, it just another reason why they're so good at what they do. Um, a few weeks ago, um, I think I was able to draw a little bit of respect for the earwig. In my opinion, I did because of just how dedicated they are as parents and as partners. I can't do the same with the bed bug. One of the distinctive characteristics of this family is something called traumatic insemination. Occurs in all but one species. And um, in this case, it's kind of as bad as it sounds. The, the male uses his penis to pierce through the abdominal wall of the female to inseminate her, even though she has a perfectly normal functioning genital tract. Uh, sometimes a female will even die from this trauma. Um, although she does have increased immunity that, that has evolved to help prevent infections. Um, I'm not going to linger on this story, but this practice is likely a result of male-male competition to place sperm closer to the ovaries than their competitors. It's so intense that males will mount any recently fed bug regardless of their sex and their, and their um, you know, condition. And uh, like many animals, the bed bug hosts its own community of bacteria in its gut that help them obtain additional nutrients that they can't get from blood alone. Uh, probably the most redeeming factor of this whole story is that bed bugs do not give us diseases. There are no known transmittable diseases that we can get from bed bugs. Uh, the same is likely true for other hosts uh, apart from humans. Still super gross. 
uh, to think about, but you know, compared to a mosquito or a tick, they're harmless. Um, so what happens when you get bit, or in this case, when a bat gets bit, maybe it's an easier picture to look at, um, just like a flea or a noceum or a mosquito or a leech, the bed bug has razor sharp mouth parts that they can use to pierce the skin to get to the blood. So sharp, we don't even feel it, you know, plus we're sleeping. So unlike the mosquito, both males and females feed on the blood. Uh, it takes the, the a longest they would be eating would be up to 15 minutes. Usually it's less anywhere from like three to 10 minutes to feed. After it feeds, the body kind of engorges and it scurries away from you as quickly as possible. But a bed bug is not very fast. Um, but when you're sleeping, it gets away as quickly as possible, tries to find a place to hide um, and then waits and digests. Pretty standard life cycle of a bed bug, um, at least in terms of all the major strategies of insects. Eggs hatch into the larvae, they undergo molts into different instars. Um, a key factor here, which we also see in ticks, is that each level up to a new instar um, requires a blood meal. So several blood meals in a lifetime. Uh, also, this is a, a good illustration on the left. You can see what an adult looks like before and after a blood meal. It's not like a tick that just kind of swells up into like comical fashion with its legs waving around. Um, a little more distinguished here, uh, it just becomes longer after it engorges itself with blood. This is the American cliff swallow bug specialized to cliff swallows and they're active only during the nesting season for cliff swallows. So they mate in the fall, they hibernate over the winter, and then they lay their eggs in the cliff swallow nest, which reliably are returned to year after year in the spring. And then the newly hatched eggs have a nice, reliable blood supply. I would imagine for those of us here in Milwaukee, there's probably a good population of these down in Warnemont Park and other places where there's bluffs uh, where we can reliably find cl cliff swallow nests. So bed bugs are super well adapted for their niche. Um, but one problem is, like I said, they're very slow and they are not, so they're, they're not super mobile. And one, an important thing for any animal is to be able to disperse in a new territory. Uh, this is where the host comes in to save the day again. Bed bugs have been observed clinging to flying bats. Um, right after they give them a little thank you kiss, which is what looks like happening here. Um, and so it's it's likely that they probably use their hosts, both birds and bats and mice and rabbits and anything. They use them to disperse into new areas. So another, another wonderful adaptation. But what about humans? Um, we can't fly. Oh yeah, we can. And we can walk and we can drive and travel on boats and stop at hotels. And, and so for the particularly for the species of bed bugs that specialize on humans, we give them everything they need, um, including a method of getting around the world. Uh, so we went through the life cycle of the bed bug, and part of that included biting you, or a bat, or a bird, or a rabbit, or a mouse. Um, so how, what, how does that affect you if you're bit? Thankfully, like I said, in almost all cases, it's not bad. Um, like, like a lot of these parasites that we've been talking about, they have anticoagulants in their saliva that keep the blood flowing, but they're not introducing new parasites into you. Um, and even if they do, they're just not surviving. So there's no, like I said, no known disease transmitted to humans by bed bugs. Um, but that saliva that gets into you is what becomes irritating, um, and for most, for a lot of the public, or a lot of the population, I should say, of humans, our immunity is such that we don't have any reaction. I think about 20% of humans have no reaction to bed bug bites, to that, that anticoagulant chemical. So um, for, for a good percentage of the population, they have no idea they were bit. Um, they're, they're none the worse, and hopefully they're not carrying them around. Um, but for some people, just like with mosquitoes, they react, uh, in similar ways to being bit by a mosquito. So you have minor swelling, minor itching, maybe a minor rash, uh, usually taken care of easily with antihistamines, 
probably your biggest risk is that you scratch a bite too hard, which could cause like a secondary infection. But for the most part, and for almost all humans, it's 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 harmless. Um, so just like a mosquito bite minus the malaria or, or other life-threatening diseases. So really other than the gross out factor, which is high, um, bed bugs are pretty benign to humans. They, they do cause more harm to other non-human animals, but even there, that doesn't appear to be like a major problem with any of those species um, with respect to bed bugs. So that's the general scoop on bed bugs, on the family of bed bugs. The particular ones that are most important to humans are in the genus Cymex. Uh, two of the three species of human uh, centered bed bugs are in this genus. So you have Cymex lectularius, also known as the common bed bug, and then Cymex hemipterus, which is known as the tropical bed bug, which is more of a problem, as you would guess, in the in the tropics. I love the the shot of the the one on the left using those just razor sharp mouth parts. And again, this is a this is a quarter of an inch long, so this is this is really magnified here um, to to tear into the fabric that it's on, uh, looking for blood. Uh, the rest of the species in this genus are known better as bat bugs, for obvious reasons. They're bat specialists. Uh, again, quarter of an inch long. Um, as is similar to other bed bugs and other hemipterans, they have a disagreeable taste to predators. That's another anti-predator uh, adaptation, is that they taste bad. And as similar as, you know, they're related to stink bugs, if you do squash them, they also release a disagreeable odor. Um, so around these parts and around most of the world, uh, Cymex lectularius or the common bed bug is the one that we hate. Uh, it's considered one of the world's major nuisance pests. Um, just about every area settled by humans. If a female feeds regularly, she can lay up to several eggs per day in her lifetime. So not everybody not all of the species undergo that that typical bed bug uh, cycle. Um, the the egg laying phase varies quite a bit through species, and for for mainly worse and worse, this bed bug can just lay a couple eggs every day, no matter where it is, no matter what it's doing, um, and this could max out at around two hundred or more eggs per month. So they're really good at not being found. And when you try to eradicate them, and it's just like with garlic mustard, it only takes one female for you to miss. And then the problem comes back. Uh, because of their reliance and preference for humans, we have a long, mostly hate-hate relationship with the common bed bug. So much so that we did a really good job of controlling them, not eradicating them, but we really, as, you know, as humans... Uh, particularly in the United States in the 50s, we did a really good job at making bed bugs pretty much go away uh, with DDT. So we hated all the insects back then. We hated the mosquitoes, the ticks, the noceums, the bed bugs. And so DDT was this cure all for everything. You've seen photos of people just going around streets and spraying kids. Kids are running behind the DDT truck, getting that spray all over them, breathing in the chemicals. Um, the thought of harmful effects on humans were not well known by the public and and um, certainly being suppressed by the people making money off of it. Um, but because of this, we did a really good job of knocking down bed bug populations. So much so that for some, bed bugs became more of like a lore, uh, a, a myth. It's, are they real? Um, so they were kind of like the hodag or the, the jackalope, probably used by parents to scare kids into cleaning their room. But um, they just, they were gone pretty much, functionally gone. Uh, but thankfully, DDT was banned. And when that happened, the bed bugs came back. So really they were just kind of hiding and waiting all this out. But part of it again, is even if they were gone from a new area, international travel, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, just, in, just increases. Um, so even after DDT is banned, um, or after DDT is banned, then you just get bed bugs back on back in business uh currently there's a huge problem in paris um as is expected with humans 
the part of the big problem is the hype, the media hype, people losing their minds. Um, and uh, that's just what we do well as humans. So, um, you know, most people think it will be under control. Maybe the, the benefit of this is people will learn more about them. Um, but uh, yeah, it is a it is a, a real problem right now. You'll you'll the news you'll be hearing it if you haven't already. Um, and you know, pretty soon after the the ban of DDT, the the first places in in the U.S. that get it are are places like New York and Philadelphia, where there's just a lot of travel, a lot of international travel. Um, it's easy. I think most of us think of right away uh, the places that we think of for bed bugs are our hotel rooms. You know, it's uh, apparently super easy to, to pick them up in your luggage. They could be hiding anywhere in the hotel room. The bed is the first place we think of. Um, and they do like beds. There's there's lots of hiding places in the mattresses and the sheets, um, but they also will just as easily hide in the carpet, in the luggage rack and other places. Um, again, they are not associated with messiness and bad hygiene, hygiene and dirtiness. Um, that's not a reliable pattern because a, a, a very clean, well-kept, expensive hotel room can harbor bed bugs just as easily as a dirtier, unkept room. Um, because of our hatred of bed bugs, there are a lot of recommendations uh, out there about how to check for them. If you read them all, you'll probably be scared into ever traveling again to a hotel. Um, uh, but, you know, one, one site person in the site recommends only putting your luggage in the bathroom. Um, you know, don't put it on the bed. Don't, I don't know. I mean, that that's, that's a, a personal choice. I'm still going to travel. Um, I'm still going to do these things. Uh, you, you could let it dominate your psyche while you're in a hotel room, maybe make it less enjoyable. So I don't know. It's a personal, personal choice, personal thought. Um, you know, maybe maybe your compromise is you just do a little bed bug check of the mattress before you go in. Um, and and thankfully, uh, Tori reminded me that all animals poop and bed bugs also poop. And um, their poop is is very easy to see on a white mattress or white sheets. They also will leave around their exuvia, the um, their exoskeleton from when they molt. So you you can, if you choose, do a, a bed bug check in a, in a hotel room. Uh, you can also use the internet. You can, you know, Google bed bugs and the name of the hotel you're going to stay in. That probably would be just as effective. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I personally hope it doesn't keep people from traveling. Um, it can also just get into your own, you can get it anywhere, not just a hotel room, but hotel rooms are obviously, um, an easier place to pick them up. So it's gross, but helpful that bed bugs do leave their presence um, sometimes. If you are unfortunate enough to bring bed bugs into your home, there is not an easy way to get rid of them. Uh, so most people, if they have the resources, they're going to hire the professionals. Uh, probably your best bet. Um, there's different ways that they can eradicate it. Maybe talk to them first and find out what methods they use. A common method is basically to turn your house into an oven. Um, bed bugs do not do well, at least the common bed bug that we have does not do well, um, with either really hot or really cold conditions. So they'll seal up your house, turn it into an oven, bake everything inside, uh, over 120 degrees for a long period of time, like slow baking cookies. Um, again, some places you can try to freeze your home. Uh, it gets a little trickier with all the pipes, maybe, maybe easier to do at your cabin up North. Um, if it's not your house, if you're worried about your clothes, uh, first thing you can do when you come back from traveling is throw your clothes in the dryer at high heat, maybe two cycles. Um, that should be enough to get rid of them. Um, if you're worried about other things like carpets or, or beds, um, it's maybe a little, there's methods of sanitizing them. Uh, some people have used like shrink wrap to suffocate them. That doesn't seem super effective at, to me since... They're just so good at waiting things out. Um, there are sprays you can use inside your house, uh, a couple different kinds. One, one uh, popular extract is from the chrysanthemum flower. 
Um, but again, I'm always worried about some of the chemicals that are in the house. So you want to check on that. Um, of course, they're not DDT, but uh, there's 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 plenty of information out there um, to help you if you do have the issue. So that is primarily it. That's the story of the bed bug. Fascinating adaptations to live with you. Very hard to get rid of because their ability to just be sneaky and hide and wait takes only one to survive the eradication attempt to start the whole process over. On the flip side, they're not going to hurt you. They're not going to spread diseases. They're just like that really, really bad roommate that you just can't get rid of. Um, there is something cool. I read that um, because they're blood suckers and 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 uh, because police forensics and and crime scenes often involve blood, uh, the bed bug is a is a favored tool for police forensics um, to help determine DNA, to help determine the timing of an incident. Um, used as evidence in crime. So that's all I have for bed bugs. I probably didn't sway your opinion on bed bugs today, um, nor was I trying, but they do tell, in my opinion, a very fascinating story. I'm going, to, so thank you for joining me. We'll see you next week. I'm going to stop sharing my screen.